This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome back into another episode of the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza. He's Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cootie. And, um, well, this is the first loss that you have to talk about because you were gone uh, following the last one uh, to Illinois. But this one was not pretty. I I'm not even sure where to start. But uh, I guess when you come off a loss like that, how do you respond? How do you get together and, and approach this week? I, this is a head scratcher for me, Jess. I, I watched the first half of this game and I'm going, we just don't look ready to play. We, we don't look ready to play. The, the Indiana is all over us. We have no answers. Like, I don't know what's happening coming out of the bye week and playing like that is it's unacceptable. And everyone is plays a blame in it from coach rule to all the way down to every player that stepped foot on that field on Saturday. It was just not good enough all around from an execution standpoint, from a effort standpoint, from anything. And when you have a game like that, it is some serious soul searching time. It is some serious look yourself in the mirror time and a lot of how do we not allow something like that to happen again? Because that's not just a loss. That is a gut punch that is a gut punch to morale it's a gut punch to recruiting it's a gut punch to where we think the rebuild needs to go and the only way you can kind of claw yourself out of that hole is by coming out and playing a hundred times better this week and you're playing against a much better opponent this week it's not gonna get any easier it's not a tune-up game like oh we're gonna come out and play utep again right like who else is coming out no you're walking into the teeth of one of the best teams in the country you better be on your P's and Q's this week. And one thing I know about Matt Rule, he's going to have those boys working this week, right? Because that's one thing he does not accept. He doesn't accept the guys quitting. He doesn't accept that stuff. So I know this week's going to be a tough gut check program for every single one of those people, including the coaches in that building. You know, it was 14-7 with four minutes left to go in the first half. And then it just absolutely snowballed. If you're, you know, playing on a team – and it starts to get out of hand. As a player, what role, what responsibility do you have to not allow that to happen again, to not allow the snowball effect? Yeah, it's the snowball effect is real. And I've been on I was at Nebraska when we got when we got beat, we got whooped. Right? I mean, I, I was with that North Wisconsin team that put 70 on us. I was at Ohio State when they hung 63 on us. I was in Michigan when we got cooked. Sometimes you just can't stop the bleeding. And I can't put a finger on it. I, I really can't. It's, it's one of those things that unless you're in the moment of it, it's really hard to explain what is happening. But sometimes when you just cannot get out of your own way and the other team feels like they can't do anything wrong, it's just one of those things where you're just trying to weather the storm and just get out of there alive. And that's what the second half of that game felt like on Saturday was Indiana could do no wrong. They were ball was bouncing their way, holes were opening up, and Nebraska could not stop stepping on their own feet. And when things like that happen, it's borderline impossible to stop the bleeding. And, you know, I think I can look back and say there's two critical points in the first half that really turned the tide. The one was the fumble by Dowdell on fourth and one, and the other one was in that two minute drive when Indiana has the ball, allowing an inside zone run to rip off for a long touchdown run. Those two things, in my opinion, turned the entire tide of this game because it gave them momentum on both sides of the ball, and it allowed them to feel like they had us pinned in the corner and they were putting their foot on the gas to not let us get up off the mat. And we were trying to get off on the mat, but when you're stepping on your own stuff and you've got Emmys and you've got guys running wrong assignments on the, on the end, you're giving up sacks, it's just an impossible thing to fight back. So I know that's not a great answer to your question, but to be honest with you, I've never been on a team that's been able to stop the snowball when the snowball started. So if you're, you know, diving into the film and there's not a ton of positives and we heard coach rule say that they watched it as a team, but how do you learn from that kind of performance? And is it more so just a, like you said, a gut check and we got to be better. There's maybe, 
not as much to learn and, and be better from is more so, hey, overall, it was just not a good performance. We just have to be better. We have to look ourselves in the mirror and be better. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to. You can you can nitpick every single play and say, well, your footwork's supposed to be this or your hand placement's supposed to be that. That route's supposed to be at eight and a half, not nine, ten, or nine, nine or ten yards. All that stuff you can coach on and you can correct. But when you have a loss like that, it comes down to you just got to man up and you just got to play better, right? We know we're capable of it. This is a better football team than what showed on Saturday. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. This is a much better football team than the performance that we put on Saturday. But that's the difference between good teams and bad teams. Good teams don't allow performances to happen like that. Bad teams can allow performances to happen like that. And we're trying to not be a bad team anymore. We've been a bad team for about a decade now. We're trying to turn the page and be a good football team, a competitive football team week in and week out. Those type of things cannot happen to this program anymore. Rule knows it. Every player on that field knows it. And so when something like that happens, the number one thing we can't do is fall back into, oh, my gosh, here we go again. Right? Like, oh, man, it happened again. And clam up and turtle up and play tight. There has to be a, like you said, the gut check and going, hey, it happened. There's nothing we can do about it. All we can do now is focus on not letting that happen again. And that's the mindset that you have to have going forward is that will not happen again. We're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to work hard. And we're going to go back to the drawing board and start back with where we are and the fundamentals of this offense, the fundamentals of this defense, and work forward from there. Well, a few things I did specifically want to dive into from that game before we move forward and, and talk about the Ohio State matchup. You had a, a player to watch was Thomas Fedoni, and he was one of the few bright spots. He had a career high in receptions and uh, yards, total yards, receiving yards at 91, six for 91, and, and made some plays after the catch and was available there in some, some big situations when Dylan needed him the most. Um, what did you see out of him in that matchup that allowed for him to, to have a more of a breakout day? Yeah, we, we talked about it last week. This was a zone coverage team. Zone coverage, how do you beat it? The tight end underneath. And I thought that Thomas did a phenomenal job of finding the voids in the zone, making himself big and making himself present a nice target for Rayola and Rayola getting through his progressions and wanting to push it down the field and not having the ball there and be able to come back underneath them. And I also thought that Satterfield did a nice job of creating pass schemes that the tight end was the first read, right? Fedoni was the first read. And when you can have a tight end that looks the part of a weapon, it can open up the playbook so much more. So many times tight ends are kind of second or third read in the pass progression. But when your tight end is the first read in a lot of these plays, it allows the ball to come out quicker. It's more quick hitting on the defense. It can slow the defense down in the run fits because they're worried about a tight end fitting in behind them. So him continuing to get more and more involved in this offense and him continuing to be more of a threat in the pass game is going to bode really well for us down the back half of the stretch. Okay, I also wanted to ask you about Micah Mazuka. We saw him come in and play some tackle. He's played primarily guard. And when the team came out for warm-ups, he was getting some extra work in, I know, on, uh, on the technique. And then throughout the game, as he went in and played tackle, he is working with Coach Raiola on the sideline. Um, first of all, how did you feel like he did, being that he has just had limited uh, snaps at tackle and then just what what that challenge is to switch like that mid-season and, and really with very limited time spent working at tackle yeah that's a really really hard thing to do and to be put in that situation on the road against a team that's beating you up pretty good and you know you're gonna be in obvious past situations i thought he came in and performed as well as you could expect him to do it's a tough thing to switch your sets Right. It's a tough thing to switch your hand placement. There's more space now in the run game between you and the defender. It, it's a very hard adjustment from a timing perspective. But the good news is, is physically he's gifted enough. He can do it. He's strong enough. He's athletic enough that he can do it. And I hope that this week he's going to get more reps at it because Gunner is young. I think he's still going to be a good player for us, but he got shown like a freshman in this game and you know coming from a guy that played as a redshirt freshman it's not an easy thing to do physically you're still developing especially when you weren't the starter going all through spring all through training camp right i got the luxury of being the starter moving through all of those things so i got those reps and i got those hard 
those hard kind of practices, but he was not. That was Turner. That was Teddy. He wasn't even the third. He wasn't even the second string left tackle, right? So he was on more of the development program, and now you're asking him to go out there and start in a Big Ten situation. It's, a, it's not fair to ask him to do, and he's done a nice job up to this point. Teams have got film on him now. They're understanding that he's a little light in the ass, and they're going to really kind of force that inside shoulder bull rush move. He's starting to lunge a little bit more, so they're starting to get around him. So he's still learning. I'm not writing him off by any stretch of the imagination saying, well, Gunner's a bust. No, he's young. He's developing. I do believe Micah is probably our best talent to get out there, part of the best five, and we're going to need him to go play left tackle for us. So it's going to be important for him to get those reps during the week because he's got a great test and some really good rushers against Ohio State this week. So, um, you know, again, the, the run game was an issue again, not being able to get going. Satterfield actually admitted today I, I, I got away from it, and a lot of it was just the game, how it unfolded, and, uh, you know, just trying to get back in it and then being forced in some, some passing situations. But, um, you know, we had heard a lot, and it's been brought up a lot with, with Dylan uh, Ryla not being more of a running threat at quarterback and with teams trying to take the passing game out of it and, and the way that they're lining up defensively, what's the solution to that? How can you um, get around that when you don't necessarily have a quarterback that's going to run it a bunch, but to be able to, to establish a run game? Yeah, not having a quarterback that's a dual threat in the college football world is definitely harder than a quarterback that is a true dual threat because the quarterback is such a hard position to account for from schematically on the defensive side of the ball for running the football. Usually he's the guy that you kind of leave as he's not involved in it. We have to focus on, hey, where's our run fits for everything else? And with Dylan not being a true running threat, it puts a lot more pressure on the offensive line and the tight ends to be much more buttoned up and not allowing some guys to be running free and stuff. And the run game, yes, Sack got away from it, but watching back the tape, I understand why he got away from it. There was free runners coming underneath. There was offensive linemen on the ground. It was not up to the standard of what a rushing football team needs to be because Every time one of those running backs got their hands on the ball, they were making someone miss before they were even at the line of scrimmage or they were getting tackled behind the line of scrimmage. And that is just not something that you can make a living in. And so Sack can't abandon the run game completely because that's not where we're at. But I do think getting some some more gun runs, more under center runs, putting some packages in with Harburg to be some running threat quarterback stuff will help us open some of the stuff up. But at the end of the day, it's about the front five and the tight ends executing their blocks on uh, going 11 for 11, as I refer to it as, is everyone doing their job because every single run play, it looks like one guy's missing here on this play and then this next guy's missing on this play. It's just everyone is taking their turn. And when that's happening in the run game, you're never going to be successful. Can you take us through the difference between being, um, you know, the, the offensive line being pretty solid at giving – Dylan time to throw it so the pass protection and then the difference between that and then opening up the holes for a running back. Yeah, pass protection is so much more of a technique driven thing. You can get away without being the bigger, faster, stronger person in the pass protection as long as you're pass setting correctly, you're staying inside out, you're understanding when to throw your hands and the angles of which the rusher is going to try and bend and where the quarterback depth is. There's so many variables that can go into the pass protection not from a technique side. Run game is a lot about being able to generate power and getting to your initial footwork and converting that into your drive footwork. So initial footwork is your first two steps, getting your two steps in the ground, making contact on two and being on the proper angle and the aiming point for the play. That's when the drive phase steps three, four, five, when you drop your hips and you're into those double teams and you're creating vertical dent into the defense. And I really think that we're struggling right now getting into that drive phase really getting ourselves into, hey, we're going to dent the defense. We're going to push the defense. And it's been very much a roller coaster throughout this year of sometimes it's really good, other times it's really bad. And unfortunately, against Indiana, it was a lot more really bad than it was really good. And that's not something that I have a magic pill that says we can fix in the middle of the season here. But I think Micah coming back and being on the left side, he's our best running run blocking offensive lineman. So hopefully him and uh, him and uh, Henry can get some holes opened up over there. Ben Scott needs to continue to elevate his game. I think he's kind of a guy that everyone leans on in that offensive line room. He needs to elevate his game more, and then so does Ben Hart. Ben Hart and Scott are the two leaders of that offensive line. They need to elevate their games. 
Okay, so just one one more thing from the, the previous game that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you had said that going into it that you thought the wide receivers for Indiana were going to be a problem. So for the, the Nebraska defensive backs moving forward, how can they be better? Some of it was just one-on-ones and Indiana wide receiver, go, they go up and make a play, right? Uh, so how can you be better at that and not allow for that to continue to, to be um, again, a lot of problems. I mean, you, you people are going to make plays. Good offenses are going to make plays from time to time. But how do you avoid it from being so much of a of an issue? I guess. Yeah, I mean, we talked about last week that back shoulder fade and and that fade ball that Indiana had has been lethal for every single team that they've played this yeah. year. And Nebraska was just another victim in that offense. And from the from the standpoint of a DB. It's about challenging the receiver at the line of scrimmage a little bit more, in my opinion, not letting him get those free releases and getting the free runs. And with the way we like to play defense, I'm not saying that Tony White needs to change his scheme schematically totally, but I would like to see a little bit more of these DBs getting up and pressing these receivers at the line of scrimmage and getting their hands on them and rerouting them and and not allowing them to get three, four steps in the ground, and then they kind of have the beat on our on our DB. I'd like to see our DBs be a lot more physical at the point of attack in the pass game. Valentino's treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations. Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition and proudly served in Memorial Stadium for over 30 years. Okay, let's um, close the chapter, move forward, talk about Ohio State. We've heard it all week from Coach Roll, the, the coordinators, the players. This is... No, no question about it. One of the most talented football teams in the country in Ohio State. But as a player, as a competitor, and you come off a performance like you just had, you're not thinking, oh, man, here we go again, right? I mean, you got to go into this week no. thinking we're, we're going to go win this football game. Absolutely. It's, it's from uh, the outside world, it's easy to look at it. But from inside those closed doors, you're preparing this game like we're going to go win this football game because they can't. Like I said, this Nebraska team is talented. It's not like we're walking into this Ohio State team completely out outclassed at every position. That's not the case. We're a competitive football team. Do we have to play our best football game up to this point in order to win this game? Absolutely. We don't have the luxury of going down and, and fumbling a ball on fourth and one or missing a chance to put points on the board with field goals or getting a pump blocked. None of those things can play a factor in this game because Ohio State is too talented. They will make you pay for every single mistake that you have against them. And that is something that has to be a huge point of emphasis this week of no gifts to Ohio State with short fields, taking advantage of when we get in the red zone and putting up seven points and not three. Like This has to be Nebraska's best all-around, all-three-phase performance if we want a chance to win this game or to be competitive in this game. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit. You mentioned it quickly uh, earlier when I had asked about the, the running quarterback. Dylan Rayola, again, three interceptions. Coach Rule said it, not all of them were his fault. Uh, and then it just, again, was a, a tough situation for him to be in. But is there an opportunity where, where you can maybe utilize uh, Heiner Carberg a little bit more to, to relieve some of that pressure to just add another element for this offense against a team like Ohio State? Yeah, I think it's important that you throw a wrinkle at Ohio State early. No, they're going to have seven games now worth of game film of what this offense is, what we like to do, what our tendencies are. They're going to have a good game plan going in of how they're going to want to attack us and stop us. So it's always good to throw in a wrinkle early in the first quarter to put Ohio State on their heels a little bit, get them to the sideline, get them to adjust to what you're doing offensively, and then kind of roll back into what you normally do best. I'm not saying gimmicky. I'm not saying like trick, double, reverse, pass, anything like that, but just a simple quarterback run game of a Wildcat. And honestly, Harbor can throw the ball too, so a play-action game out of a Wildcat situation and just putting a special package in there to make Ohio State think on their feet I think is going to be important this week. So, so how could the? I mean, the, look, I, I, we can spend all day talking about all the things that the defense did wrong. They know it. They've talked about it. But they're better than what they showed, what they put on on tape. But against a team like Ohio State, what are you looking for the defense to try to slow down some of those really explosive weapons of Ohio State? Yeah, the first thing is going to be limiting the explosive plays in the run game. Way too many ten plus yard runs for Indiana, and Ohio State's going to go okay. 
That's what Indiana did. We're going to try and do it as well. We're going to try and run the football. We're going to be physical. I mean, Simmons, their left tackle, Donovan Jackson, one of their guards, very talented offensive line, multiple NFL players up on that front four, uh, front five, you know, going against the strength of our defense, which is Ty Robinson and Nash and Jamari Butler and those guys. So it's really going to start with those front four guys trying to limit the the – offensive run plays of Ohio State and it's weird to say let's make Ohio State one dimensional and throw the football because woo they've got some really good receivers on the outside you know but you kind of have to pick your poison here you you can't try and cover both Ohio State's too talented if you try and say hey we're going to try and do this hybrid stop the run but also play coverage on the back end they're just going to be able to pick and choose what they want to do if I'm Tony Watt I'm selling out to stop the run and I'm challenging Malcolm Hartsogs and Sierra Wright and Tommy Hill and Deshaun Singleton and Isaac Gifford and saying hey butt up get these guys physical with them throw them around they're going to make some plays if they catch the ball give them a hard hit a legal clean hit don't do anything stupid and get injected Right, but make these guys feel you from a physicals presence, and then we can kind of play from there. But defensively, we're going to have the toughest test that we've had up to this point this year by far. Okay, uh, what, are, what are the keys for this one? What are some things that have to happen for the Huskers to, to maybe go up there and pull off an upset? Yeah, the, the number one key here for me is just to not try and force it on either side of the ball and play hero ball. Right, Everyone needs to understand what happened last week, but hero ball cannot be a thing where you think, okay, I'm going to be the player that's going to change everything because I'm going to get the game-playing interception and I'm going to force it and maybe I'm going to try and jump a route that I shouldn't and it's a double move and, oh my gosh, there he goes over my head. right? Or a running back that's going, hey, we got to get the run game going. I'm going to bounce this one because if I can make this corner miss, I know it's going to be a long play and then it's a TFL. Don't try and force the big play. Don't try and force the game-changing play. Stay calm and play within the system, both of offensively and defensively. The second key is going to be special teams. We have to flip the field on Ohio State. We have to be able to take a punt and pin them deep, make them go 80 yards, make them go 90 yards, and rely on our defense on getting a stop. You have a bad punt or a pump blocked, and you give Ohio State the ball at the 50, you're almost guaranteeing them three points, right? So from a defensive standpoint, getting a chance to get a punt return or anything like I think the punt, the punt and the punt return are my second key here of being game changers, right? Bush, excuse me. Buscini is a weapon. Let's make sure we utilize them the most. And then from the punt return side, let's not do dumb things like catch the ball and step out of bounds at the one yard line. If we have a chance to return one, don't fair catch it, right? Take the chance. If you have a return, you got a 10 yard cushion, try and make something happen. The special teams on the punt and punt return are gonna be really important. And then the last thing is take care of the football. Take care of the football. Three interceptions, I mean, that's unacceptable, a fumble, right? We've been really good in the turnover margin this year. It's part of the reason we're five and two versus what we were looking at last year. We have to get ourselves back into the positive side of the turnover margin. I have a player in mind on defense, but uh, I'm curious to see who's your or your player to watch here on, on defense. It, it's going to be Tommy Hill. Mm -hmm. Tommy Hill is, is a player, you know, you're going against some really talented receivers, that freshman receiver for Ohio State. I'm, I'm, his name's escaping me at the moment. Um, extremely talented. One of the best receivers in the country as a, as a freshman. You know, Tommy Hill, you want to go play in the NFL? This is the week to go. This is the week. You did great against those guys against CU. You've struggled the last couple of weeks. You're coming off the injury. He's a guy that I'm looking to have a big game this week if we have a chance to win. I would like to see a bounce back performance from Ty Robinson. I thought he was too quiet against Indiana. Yeah, they, they definitely tried to limit his ability. They double teamed him a lot. They really kind of circled number nine and said, hey, we're not going to let him beat him. We'll beat us. We're going to frustrate him. We're going to double team him in the run game. We're going to slide to him in the pass game. You know, and when they do that, other guys got to show up. Right. If they want to try and take away nine, it's on guys like Elijah Judy. It's on guys like Jamari Butler on MJ Sherman to, hey, if we're getting the one-on-one -on -one blocks, we got to win these matchups so they can stop sliding to tie and stop trying to limit him to give him some more opportunities. Right. Guys like Williams. Williams was really quiet this week after his big week against Rutgers. So, you know, guys all across that front are going to have to step up in order to open up tie so that he's not the focal point that people can focus on. All right. How about offensively? Who are you looking for to have a big day? You know, if we want to win this game, Dylan Rayola has got to be the best version of Dylan Rayola. 
you know, he's been kind of a roller coaster the last few weeks. He started the year really strong, and I understand things are not all his fault, but in order to win a game like this on the road in a very hostile environment, you've got to have stellar play from your quarterback position. And so for Dylan to be the best version of himself, to be confident in the game plan, to be confident in his ball placement, too many times last week I saw him throwing balls kind of off his back foot when he had the ability to kind of step up in the pocket and let one rip. I need to see him getting back to base fundamentals, base mechanics, and really operating within this scheme because he will be the reason that we win or lose this football game on the offensive side of the ball. Last thing I got for you, I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it there with, with Tommy Hill, but you got another game on, on Big Fox, 11 a.m., their, their primetime game. But when you and I have talked about this the last several years, if, if you're a guy that's looking to go to the NFL, this is one of those game films that – Scouts turn on to see how are you matching up, right? I mean, this is a big opportunity for this program with a lot of eyeballs on it once again. And then also when you talk about the future and, and setting yourself up to maybe uh, catch some attention at the next level. If you want to play on Sundays, this will be the first tape that the NFL scouts will pull up because this is going to have the most NFL players on the opposing team that you will play all year. Right. This Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia, Oregon, they're farm teams for the NFL. They have been for a decade now. You want to play on Sundays? You go stick it to one of these guys. Right. And that way, when you're going through the pre-draft process, you can go turn on Ohio State. Watch <laughs> me lock this dude up. Right. That's the kind of mentality you have to have walking into this game from an individual standpoint. Obviously, from a, a team standpoint, it's a huge game bounce back hey we got punched in the face on national tv this week that's not who we are let's give a chance we, luckily we have another shot here to show the world show the nation who we are right that's a big piece of this and but from an individual standpoint you want to play in the next level go stick it to these dudes on the buckeyes good stuff as always my friend let's uh have a better performance to break down Ooh. next week huh Please, I would very much like to have a very happier Saturday this week. So please, Big Red, go out there and do their things. But as always, you know, we're going to support them. You know, we're here. We know we're going to love them up, right? There's no panic in me right now. Right. But I would really love us to see come out and have just a better performance than we did last week, win, lose, or draw. A lot of season, right? I mean, don't push the panic button. There's still a lot no. of big opportunities for this football the, program. The panic button is far away from being pressed. However, I do think this is a turning point. This is a turning point in our season. You, you can turn – it's going to go one way or the other, right? I've heard people being like, man, we're staring five and seven in the face. It's like, okay, calm down over there, <laughs> right? But, like, this is a chance to – you go – I'm not even saying that you go beat Ohio State, but you go be competitive with Ohio State and you, you bring it to a one-score game with a chance to win in the fourth, that's a step in the right direction when you're talking about building a program and building what kind of culture Nebraska wants to be. All right, for Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. This has been the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Thanks for listening and watching. Go Big Red. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe has become a Nebraska tradition for over 65 years. Proud to be the official pizza of the Huskers.